Awesome. Uh, okay, so welcome everybody on the 10 Deadly Sins session. Uh, my name is Paula Januszkiewicz and I am from Poland. Uh, I work as a penetration tester, so I do not work for Microsoft, just to clarify what do we have over here, so I will tell you the truth and the only truth. Uh, today we're going to play with a couple of security issues regarding the infrastructure that I see in my everyday work when I'm doing the penetration test. Uh, I'm also an MVP on enterprise security and MCT. So this is my background, and the only thing I do is, as I said, penetration testing, sometimes training, consulting, and so on, but everything is around the security field. Uh, probably you were wondering why 10 and why deadly sins. So every time I do an audit, I usually see the mistakes that people commit during their everyday tasks. And sometimes these mistakes allow me to gain access to, and that's the story, to some parts of the infrastructure that, of course, I shouldn't be allowed to get access to. So this is the background of the whole presentation. Uh, we we're going to discuss today 10 deadly sins, but we won't go through the solutions. I would like to show you what is in infrastructures nowadays, but the solutions to these problems are usually very complex, and they base more on the attitude rather than technology over here. Okay, so a couple of things to discuss. Um, first of all, this is our agenda. And as you see, it's pretty simple. I usually keep it simple. <laughs> so, hope things are clear. That's something that you see? Because I do. Whenever I enter the server room on the client premises, that's what I see. Of course, not every time. Sometimes you have this, you know, idyllic organizations, and then you feel really, like, really real pleasure. But that's something that happens, like, every, in every day's world. So imagine the situation in this kind of server room, that administrator, he's somewhere in Hawaii sipping Caperinia, something is happening in the network, and then you need to call this guy and explain what was happening. Please pick this yellow cable. How can you imagine that? And what if the administrator is gone? So th these are the sins that we're going to discuss. Of course, not the mess in the server room, but a couple of other interesting examples. So let's start. And sorry to make it obvious at the beginning. I know everybody's talking about the passwords, make your password complex enough, blah, 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 blah. But it's not the case. We're going to discuss the password misusage. So Every time we change the password, we share it with something, somebody, somewhere. So whenever you change your password, you share it with, for example, domain controller. Whenever you change your password or set up your password, you share it with LinkedIn. You know the LinkedIn case lately, right? It's not very positive to share passwords with them. Facebook, other services, services and operating system, we always share our password. But here comes the very basic question. What if? you lose your password. Do you feel like you're done because you cannot recover and so on? So the answer should be, no, it's not a problem, it's just a password, I do have a backup solution, and I can figure out what's going to be the solution for this kind of situation. Okay, so let me show you. First demo, and this session is really intensive, so we do not focus on the theory, uh, with the small password misusage. So first of all, I'm going to switch to my domain controller. So let me enlarge it. And I will create a service. So I'm going to run sccreate, put the service name. So let's say tehet123, whatever the, the name is. I will put the name, uh, the path for the, for the file that's going to host the service. So it's going to be bin path and equals, and that's pretty important to put a space over here, no comments, otherwise it's, it won't work. 32, and I'm going to run it on notepad.exe. Notepad.exe, okay, awesome. So, let's switch to services. I will refresh the view, and you see this tahet123 service over here running. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch 
properties, log on tab, and I'm going to run the service with the administrative account. So let me put password here. Okay. So what's the problem? Whenever I'm doing the penetration test, this is one of the first things that I check. SQL Server, you know the issue, installing the SQL Server database on the domain admin account. I know, maybe you are not doing this, but this is what I see like in every company. There is at least one service, it doesn't need to be SQL of course, that is running on a domain's admin account. Let me show you what it means. Okay, so I will save it. And I cannot start it because Notepad it's not a service, so it not, it's not written to talk to service manager. So, but it's not a problem over here. Let me switch back to the console again, and um, I will be back to root because it's going to be a little bit more comfortable for me. And first of all, I will run psexec. psexec. This is a tool written by Mark Rusinovich. You can download this from sysinternals.com, and this is a tool that allows you for many things, including impersonating yourself to the local system account. So I'm going to run it with the S switch for a system. I'm going to run it also with I switch and D switch to make it interactive because whenever I'm running the console in this case of CMD exe, I need to be able to touch it. That's why the service and PSExec registers itself as a service needs to be interactive for me just to be able to play with it. And I would like to run it in the separate window. Okay, so here we go. If I try to find out who am I, as you see, I am an anti-authority system, which means I do have a total privileges in the operating system. Uh, maybe not total, but 99%, definitely higher than uh, administrator. But it's not the point over here. The point is that I do have here the tool that is written by my friend. He is a developer. And uh, he said one day that he would like to make my life a little bit easier, and he wrote this tool, uh, to be able to get passwords from the LSA secrets. Local security authority, it's a mechanism in operating system within which uh, there are many security-related tasks happening, including, for example, protecting passwords uh, for the services over here. Okay, so the service name was Tehet123, and... If you are interested, what is my admin password on the virtual machine? You've got it. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that every time you run something, meaning a service, with the domain's admin account or whatever the account is, but it's not a built-in account, the password is stored in the registry. Why? Because if you take this laptop server, whatever it is, off the network, the service still needs to be running. That's why we do have a password in the registry. So let me bring you the very, very typical scenario. Domain users being a local admins on their workstation. Have you seen that? Yes. Okay, so, ta-da! So this is the user who becomes really evil in this case. Okay, so uh, this, is the, this is the first thing. The solution for that, it's something that is called managed service account. And that's something that is available since Windows Server 2008 or 2. And this is one of these accounts with the dollar sign, which means um, it's not a dollar sign that makes it, but it's an account without the password. So it's a very typical uh, account if it's about, for example, network service, local service, local system, really similar, but working on a domain level. So we actually, actually have a solution for that problem, but nobody does this. Okay, so the second thing to show you, interesting so far? Okay, cool. Uh, the second thing to show you is that um, I will go to users, administrator, desktop, and I will go to Kiwi. And this is a new tool that is like on the top blacklist by Microsoft. Um, sounds pretty fancy. Uh, what it does, uh, it connects and injects the DLL into an LSASS.exe, Local Security Authority Subsystem Process, and it unprotects the memory using the hidden function of LSA so that you could see everything that was happening in Windows. Okay, so let me jump to the console. Uh, Mimikatz, this is how it's called. You can download it uh, online for free. 
And it's in French, so I'm sorry for that, but the author said that he would like to, you know, make the world safer. So that's why it's in French. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I need to have a debug privilege to be able to jump into an LSA uh, secrets. So I need to set it up for me. And then I need to go inject process LSA SS exe with the DLL that is available here. Secure LSA the DLL. Yeah. Okay, we are doing the injection. As you see. And um, there's a bunch of functions available. Get logon passwords, for example. Let me let, let the screen go. But what it does, it displays the password in the clear text of every user that ever logged in to this machine. Microsoft doesn't like it, believe me. So, what is the thing here? If somebody would like to, and let's say it's just a user, would like to display all the passwords of the other users logging in to the same workstation because they are working for shifts, here you have. And this is one of the situations that you may impersonate in somebody's account and so on. So we can imagine the rest of the scenario, but this is what is happening over here. Okay. So with this positive accent, let me connect to uh, let me switch to the, 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 the other part of the presentation. Okay, so ignoring offline access. I know, offline access, it's not fancy anymore. Of course, if you do have an offline access to somebody's computer, of course, you can do everything. But it's not the point. The point is, what kind of nice stuff can you do to hide yourself and at the same time it inject things somewhere in the operating system to give you the information that you want? So we are actually not protecting offline access. You can imagine, even maybe in your organization, if somebody steps in, is this person able to take, let's say, somebody's laptop and walk away? Yes, no, y you can answer yourself. But in the vast majority of organizations, let's say people go for a lunch, and I jump in and I say, hey, I do have this you know, review and I'm applying for a job, really common scenario, please, and so on, this is the chair that I'm going to. And of course, I can walk to the company, this is this room around the corner, and I take somebody's laptop, and we can have fun with that. Okay, so for that, let me show you a demo with the sophisticated offline access, within which we can actually hide ourselves, whether we are replacing the files, and um, even if the admin is going to scan for the malicious files in the operating system, he won't be able to find it because there is a really fancy way to hide yourself in the operating system. Okay, so uh, let me switch again to the virtual machine, to the domain controller. Okay, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to restart it. And uh, I will show you what is the configuration. So I'm actually restarting to um, the CD, so the Windows PE over here, so that um, I will be able to uh, inject something being offline. On my, yes, on my Tuesday session, I've showed you that uh, it's possible actually to reset even a domain admin password using uh, the possibility to replace the utilman, which is the keyboard and so on, uh, the, the magnifier, and uh, putting a, a console instead of it. But if you run SFC command, with the verify switch, it's gonna tell you that this tool, because Utilman, it's an operating system tool, was replaced and yeah, something is happening. But there is a very nice place in the operating system uh, in which we can inject file if you need to. And this is called image file execution options. So if you are playing with debugging, probably you know the, uh, the, you know the switch, but we may actually use it for a little bit geekier uh, purpose. Okay, so let me click next. And you know you've seen the screen. I will click repair your computer. I'm searching for the operating system. Uh, operating systems here. So this is Windows Server 2008 or 2 that I'm running. Next. And here, I'm going to run um, first break edit. 
And this is the registry editor that is uh, for Windows PE, so the, the one that is in the offline mode. So to connect to the registry, I just need to go to File, Load Hive, and go to the operating system area, which is in our case the D drive. And then I need to go to Windows, so let me actually type it. Windows, then System32, then Config, thank you. You remember from the previous session, cool. And Software, open. Uh, yeah, uh, let's me, let me call it like, for example, Tehet, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we are there. Take it, and here we go. So uh, in this case, we need to go to Microsoft, Windows NT, current version, and then image file execution options. So let me expand it to make it a little bit more visual. So what is that? This option allows you to use a debugger to debug an application. So if I create a key over here, so new key, and I'm going to call it, again, utilmon.exe. I will put here the string value with the name debugger. And what's going to be the debugger for utilmon.exe? CMDXE. Exactly. So what's going to happen? If I reboot, you will see that you're actually able uh, to run the console be, be, without being even discovered whenever somebody is doing a scanning for the malformed operating system files. Isn't it cute? Yeah, I think the same. OK, so we do have here this debugger configured, but we are not over yet. So I'm going to switch to D again, and I'm going to use users, administrator, and then um, desktop, and then Kiwi. Because it's not over with Mimikatz, so let me run it first, you are actually able to dump the hashes of the passwords that are locally on the machine being offline. Isn't it unusual? Definitely. So uh, to do this, you need to do some dump, hashes, uh, and then you need to specify the name, uh, of the path for the system branch in the registry, which is Windows System32 config system, and then you need to specify the path to the SUM database that you would like to dump. So it's going to be Windows again, Windows, yes, System32, then it's going to be config, and it, then it's going to be SUM. Okay, so here we go. And if the user is still not a local admin, but the user has an offline access, I would say, isn't he local admin right now? Definitely he is. And you, we can imagine that even with this uh, putting this uh, image file execution options over here, user still can be a local admin, because this user can now press the button uh, on the logon screen. So uh, let me actually reboot it to show you this. We're going to need this machine later on anyway. And this user will be able to reset a domain's, the, I'm sorry, the local admin's password. And then you know the scenario. We can uh, elevate ourselves in many, many different scenarios. Not directly, but we need to figure out how to do this. OK, so before I log in, let me actually restart the machine. It's going to be restarting right now. And let's switch to the next part of the session. OK, incorrect access control. And what I mean by this, it's playing with a different solutions, playing with NFS, for example, uh, NTFS, uh, for example, and so on, changing the permissions to specific files, folders, and so on, in the way that we don't know what we are actually doing. So for example, uh, very, very often seen by me in the company, there is a problem that whenever somebody is writing a service, so there's some application and it has its own service. Usually, for example, it's a network scanner, the, the better one, for example, GFI and so on, database, whatever, very special database that creates a service in the operating system. The service is very often not in Windows folder, not even in a program files folder, but somewhere else. 
which means it does not inherit the permissions that are the default permissions for the operating system folders, which means it's only the developer's or ID Pro's imagination what you're going to put over there. And sincerely, usually, it's too much, which means you can rename the service file and impersonate yourself being, for example, a print operator, that's something that I'm going to show you, to local system. Okay, the second thing is that we are setting all these ACLs and so on, but in the operating system, there are many different privileges that are not used by default by many applications, but nobody said that they are not there, that you can use to bypass ACLs. What do you think? Isn't the world beautiful right now? You want to get access to somebody's files, here you have. And that's actually possible whenever you are running something that is called the backup mode. It's actually a kind of marketing name, but the privilege is called backup read and backup write privilege. So these two, whenever you use them, you are able to bypass ACLs. Do you remember the times, it was a couple of years ago, whenever you were doing a backup, it was not possible, for example, to backup open files? Sometimes you could see that they're not backed up. Why? Because we do not have appropriate, for example, permissions to these files. It's, it's not a matter of handle. So bringing back the story here, I would like to show you two scenarios. First of all is how to bypass ACL on the folder, so to copy the file that we don't have privileges to. And the second thing is how to rename the file that the service is running on, and what does it mean practically? So what the user can do, for example, to impersonate himself or her herself to the local system account. Okay, so let me jump with my machine over here. That's it. And the thing that I was talking about is over here, right? So you saw it already with YouTube on. But what we've done, we've done this differently. There are no renames, right? So we just played a little bit with the operating system options. It's just a WinLogo session, so we can run here whatever we want. It just looks differently. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, authenticate myself as administrator. Okay, and I do have a folder on the root drive over here, and it's called backup read. Whenever I try to open it up, you see that I do, have, I do not have the appropriate permissions. Yeah, 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 I'm an admin, I know, but it's not the point over here. That's not something that I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you that it's possible to bypass privileges. So let me show security, users, uh, and administrator. He's denied to access to this folder, even if the ICLs are set up differently. Okay, so console. We need a console for that. And on desktop, I do have here backup write folder, and it's empty. So we're gonna copy stuff that is in backup read to the backup write folder. Okay, so if I do copy, and I will do C, backup read to C, uh, users, administrator, desktop, and to backup write, then you see access is denied. Nothing surprising, actually. But if I do the same, but I will run Robocopy. Hmm. It shouldn't be like this. I mean, we do not have the permission to read stuff that is in the folder, but somehow it happens that we can do this. It shouldn't be like this. But uh, no comments. Okay, the next thing is that if we use the B switch, then you see that copied, it's one. So actually, when we jump to this backup write folder over here, it's here, you see that I do have a file copied over here. So it's, it's not a rocket science, and you may say, yeah, we were administrators to be able to 
get this backup read and backup write and so on. But backup operator can do this also, and local admin can this do this also. So this is the, again the story with the local administrators as users plus backup operators. If you have them, then be aware that this is the privilege that they get. That's why they are backup operators because they are running in the backup mode. Okay, the next thing to show you. So let me co uh, cancel this one. The next thing to show you is uh, the service that is running in the folder in the place it should not run, of course. So let me sort the services by the description. And here you have the Pola service. Um, and the Pola service, as you see, it started. So I'm going to impersonate myself from the print operator to the local system account just by renaming the file that I do have the permissions to. But first, let me run the registry. And let me enlarge it a little bit so that you see that in the registry, in the winlogon key, this is winlogon content, I do not have anything that looks really as this thing should not be here. Everything is legit here. OK, so what to do? We need to switch user. And I'm going to log in as a print operator. This is the main controller, so just to simplify it, but I'm still a print operator, meaning I cannot edit the services. Switch user. Yep. And let me again. Oh. Yeah, should be OK. Yeah. It will be interesting if you change the password. <laughs> OK, so he's definitely evil. We are going to the folder in which services are based uh, with the specific application. And we do have here the stahead folder. So I'm going to use the very similar operation that I've showed you on the, on the presentation on Tuesday. But I'm going to show you from the different perspective. So the good one is the one that the service is running on. So I'm going to rename it. And I will underscore. I put the under underscore sign here, rename it bad one to be the good one, and the Freddy's job is done. So what, now we may switch user and wait for the restart from the administrative perspective, because the service needs to be restarted to be able to take into consideration the new file that we've just injected over here. OK, so administrator again, password, OK. Uh, before I restart the service to show you that things are going to pop up over here, I'm going to run PowerShell uh, with administrative privileges, and I'm going to run Active Directory modules here. Not only these, but also Active Directory. And I'm going to enter desktop. And um, on the desktop, I do have um, demo on PowerShell because this is one of the solutions that we, cannot, we can actually introduce over here. So to be able to monitor services that are not in Windows folder and that are not in the program files folder, we need to, for example, find ourselves a tool, which in this case is going to be the auto runs, or use PowerShell that is available for everybody. So I do have a Tehead script here. And how the script is working. It's displaying you the command that I'm running, and then it's displaying you a result. I'm using the WMI, Windows Management Instrumentation, to get the list of the services using the option, uh, as you see, Win32 underscore service. So you, if you are familiar with WMI, you are probably using this uh, as a pure, pure option. OK, so what I'm going to get here is, simply speaking, the service name and its display name. So this was very simple. The next thing is that I'm going to display a display name and the path name to be able to monitor services that are not in the Windows folder or Program Files folder. So as you see, a lot of services, and some of the, them are in the Program Files folder, some of them are in Windows. So we do actually have, we, we have actually here a huge list of uh, services, including my service that is running somewhere else. So this is the moment you're going to find out that the services may be somewhere else. OK, so let me clear the screen. And the next thing is if you would like to filter it out, 
So what are the services running somewhere else than Windows, which is by default protecting the service file? Here you have the list. I think it's enough. It's it's super short command, it's super easy, and it gives you the view of your operating system. And it can be run, of course, remotely. So you may do this like every Friday on your every server and verify if there is something new that pop up, pops up. The, the disadvantage of this solution is that if you do have a services that are hidden, meaning the start type is zero or one, meaning boot or device driver, uh, as for example Stuxnet did, then you won't be able to see the services over here. Then you just need to monitor the registry. Okay, so time to restart the service. Um, let me switch to services.msc, Polar service, and I'm going to restart it. And it's taking into consideration the bad file, that is now a good file. So if you even click the properties, it's going to be the good file, which is the bad file. And over here, as you see, I do have additional key that pop up. Which means that Freddy, being a print operator, impersonated himself into the local system account. Really nice, quick way to get yourself the biggest privileges that you can have in the operating system. Any questions? Okay, not for now. The next thing, if it's about technologies and so on, is, and this is the sin that I think it's really important, using the old technology. You remember this? Of course. It, it was a pleasure. Everybody was playing this. And uh, using a, the old technology, of course, it's not the best idea. That's uh, not, not a surprise. But 2003, do you think it's an old technology or not? Old. Yeah, well, now we have 2011, so it's a very old technology. But we are still using, uh, using this technology, aren't we? Definitely. Who has no 2003 in the infrastructure? Put your hands up couple of you, only a couple of you, I don't know, like 1% of the room? Okay, so tell me, put your hands up if you still run Windows 2000. Okay, don't be afraid, I'm not pointing to you directly. 10% uh, of the room, anti 40 anybody? Yeah, a couple of you. Um, okay, so let me go deeper. 3.51. Nobody? Or you are maybe just ashamed to confirm it, right? Okay, oh, that's pretty positive. Uh, usually, somehow, not very often, but it happens still in many, many organizations. Usually governmental, I don't know why. Okay, so a uh, couple of things regarding updates and new technologies and so on. There is a technology that is called software restriction policy. And software restriction policy was and is now replaced by an applicator. And the question is why it was replaced by an applicator. And the answer is because it works. If it's about SRP, I would like to show you based on the regular setting of the user on Windows XP, because that's, that's where I can use it, uh, that we are actually able to bypass it super easily and say like, you're gonna allow, disallow me running my applications, stupid admin. I was like, I've got my own GP disable. And I'm the owner of explorer.exe. And if something is based on explorer.exe, as you know, then there is no security in this process. So, let me run XP here. So, the configuration is like this. I do have here that rule with the software restriction policy that is disallowing me to run notepad.exe. Really? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bypass this rule. So first let me run notepad.exe to show you that it's actually true. So I'm not able because of the software restriction policy, blah, blah, blah. Task manager. And if we go to explore.exe, I'm logged in as an administrator, but it's not a problem over here. It may be a regular user. Uh, I'm the owner, so it's not system, it's not anybody else, it's just myself. If, you, if, if the Winnie the Pooh was logging in, you will see here Winnie the Pooh, he's the owner of the Explorer.exe. 
Cool. So uh, in Toolkit, I do have gpdisable.exe. And at the end of the session, I'm going to post the link that I've posted on my previous session with the tools, because I'm the fan of preserving the history. So this tool is no longer available in the internet. It was written by Mark Rusinovich when he was not working for Microsoft Surprise. And of course, if you search for like firms, blah, 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 you're going to find it, but it's not that obvious. So if you want the tool, you can download this from my website. I think just it, the tool cannot be gone, right? Notepad.exe. GP disabled notepad.exe. Oopsie, right? So that's what I mean. That's the difference between SRP and AppLocker. AppLocker works, SRP doesn't. OK, so the next stuff to show you, let me be back with this ugly operating system, is something related to encryption. So again, you may say, like, yeah, encryption. Everybody is saying, mentioning this encryption, of course, whenever we do, sn do the sniffing of the network and so on. But it's not my point over here. My point is that if you share your password with somebody, the question is with whom you share the password. And if the password during the sharing process is going somewhere else, is this process encrypted or not? Sometimes. Encryption does not solve the problem, because encryption may be done in many layers. So we may, for example, encrypt the traffic using IPsec and so on, but at the same time, we may encrypt the traffic on the application layer, and that's something that is done by the application, right? So I don't care if you do encrypt tra traffic within the IPsec channel. If I sniff because I am in the network, I can listen to the stuff that users are putting whenever they are running HTTP websites. So that's what I'm talking about over here. And very, very often, people uh, somehow confuse the layers of the encryption. They think whenever they encrypt something, then we are secure. Of course, we are not. I would like to show you two things over here uh, regarding the encryption. So first of all, uh, I would like to show you one simple website. I'm sure you know it, you're using it, and so on. So this website is linked in. <laughs> I'm running uh, this live in the internet, so it's actually a real LinkedIn. And in the background, I'm running Fiddler. Fiddler is a free web debugger to debug uh, the, the HTTP and HTTPS traffic. So first of all, let me tell you what kind of configuration do I have. Fiddler options, tools filter options, HTTPS, and then I do have several settings configured. So first of all, I'm going to capture HTTPS traffic, decrypt it, yeah, as you see, and ignore certificate errors. So I'm doing this locally on my machine, but I'm traveling a lot. And believe me, some hotels are doing HTTPS inspection. Can you tell me why? Why are you doing this? I mean, they would like to preserve the, the network to be super secure, no malware inside, hotel guests are evil, and so on. But it's just a hotel. So if you do have application that does not encrypt passwords inside, if somebody, hotel, is sniffing to the traffic, and they are because that's why they are doing HTTPS inspection, the question is, what goes over the wire? OK, so I'm going to authenticate here using HTTPS as Susanna Boss at live.com. This is my second identity. She's got a social security number. OK, no. Oh, that's my mistake. Now it should be better. Yeah, that's Susanna. She's pretty cute. So over there we can check out what actually we were able to capture. And this traffic over here, when I go to web forums, you can see that even if I was using HTTPS, the password goes in a clear text. Did I mention that LinkedIn is unprofessional? Maybe I shouldn't, but I just did it. So as you see, it's not perfect, and it's just LinkedIn a super professional used by millions application. What about your applications? The second thing is IPsec configuration. 
So let me switch to my machine again. Okay. So I'm going to show the desktop, awesome. And uh, I do have here FileZilla server, so I may actually run it. And this is, the, of course, the FTP server. So I do have also a client, and let me close this one, uh, and a FileZilla client, awesome. So first I will run the console over here, and I will enter desktop, and I will enter hooks. Do you know application hooking, process hooking? So what is it? So whenever we do have a process, depends how it's written, of course. Um, technically, it's application at the end. Uh, there is a space that developers may or may not leave to be able to control application in their own way. So for example, debugging and so on. Uh, of course, hooking may be used in a different way, meaning I will hook the function that is responsible for authenticating me to the FTP server, and I will just bypass all the traffic that I have from this, ser from, from, from this server ser service. So whenever the user is authenticating to myself, I'm like, okay, so th that's this authentication that is happening. I'm, gonna do, I'm going to hook it, and then I will display and do whatever I want, the passwords of the whole situation that is happening over here. Okay, so uh, for host, um, I'm going to, uh, to connect to 10, 10, 10, 1, because this is the domain controller, and I'm going to use Freddy account. It's not a domain account, but it doesn't matter, with the password super secure. Okay, but before I do this, and w before I click quick connect, then I'm going to run hook.exe to the process FileZilla to hook it. Okay, quick connect. Let me do this one more time. Oh, we are still connecting. Uh, abort, and one more time. So as you see, everything that is happening over here is actually monitored. So even if you are using IPsec and I'm hooking your application on the different layer, I'm able in this case to uh, as you, as you see, uh, listen to everything that is happening. So all the stuff that I see in the application is actually sent to me. So if I will authenticate over here as Freddy, I'm going to see the, everything that is going through the FTP server, which is the username and password and so on and so on. So what do you think? Yeah, so that's just a different layer that, that we may use over here. Okay, let, let me turn it off. Okay, here, we're, here we have logged on. And let me do ipconfig. OK. OK, good. So, so this, is, this is what is actually happening if I'm using the, the hooking for the application. Anything that is, goes, is going over here. Of course, the function must be targeted. So you may say that you would like to see the only whenever the password is encrypted, depends how the application is written. But in this case, you're going to see everything that is happening over here. Could not connect to the server doesn't actually matter. You see what is, what is happening here. OK, so LinkedIn and hooking, these are two situations within which the layer really matters. Okay, let me jump here. The next thing that I'm going to show you is installing pirated software. Pay attention to the Windows versions. I took this photo. It's not stolen from any, anywhere. It's mine photo when I was on a vacation in Syria lately. And uh, really, I took it. I was there. So um, you see that they do have a different attitude to the operating system versioning. It's a little bit more rich. And uh, the question is, who checks for the passwords, for, for the file signature? So IT people, they usually tend to have their own repository, do you know what I mean, IT people? Like whenever you don't want to download this 500 super large megabyte file, you've got it somewhere on the share in the network, and whenever the user asks you, could you please install this super nice application to me, you're like, of course, yep, yeah, that's here, and, and everything is working. Really? The question is, and I've done some small survey on Tehet, do you check for the file signatures before you install them? Because you are doing this as an admin. This is the privilege that you need to install the stuff. So you're doing with this with the highest possible privileges, like with your own account. 
So do you check for the signatures? Because the file may be malformed. Not just by user, through the downloading process. Whenever you download tools for, from sysinternals.com, for example, on the way, it may be injected with malware. And before you even get it, you even get the file, it's already with malware. If you don't believe me, see SIM314 session that we were talking uh, about uh, in Atlanta with Marcus Murray. We were doing the injection on the live. Before you get the file, it's already with malware. So do you check? Of course, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the next one. Do you do the periodical checks? And they're like, mm, yeah, we do have this antivirus scanning and so on. And the answer was not that straight. But finally, no, right? So let me show you the demo. Malware around the corner. OK, let me go to the virtual machine. Here we have. Let me close this one. Yes. OK, so what do I have over here? Um, I do have an installation of the uh, malware file. So, OK, this is actually over here. And um, this is a regular installation first for the Word Viewer. But I'm going to inject malware in the Word Viewer installer so that you will never notice that actually malware was there. Before I do this, I would like to show you the proof that uh, my Windows folder, it's actually pure txt. So as you see, file not found. Um, because I'm going to write a file in the Windows folder, providing you the proof that I do actually have a, a little bit more functionality that you can expect. OK, so um, we do have here demos. And let me switch to the malware. And uh, what I do have here, uh, it's a BART script. It's pretty simple. What it does, it just uses the malware file and the Word Viewer installation file with my engine, in fact, .exe, to be able to just to put .exe file in another .exe file. Really useful if you're doing the penetration test. Like, could you please install this for me? Huh, thank you. OK. Uh, so let me run it. An infected.exe. It's just for my backup. So it's very, very simple. I'm doing the, 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 the stuff that you see in the script. Yes, infected successfully. And we are running the infected file, which looks like a, a rigid word viewer installation. And we actually, our job is done over here. So we may close this one. And if I go to a console and do the same here, you see that Polo's malware was here which means that uh, using your privileges to install software, you should always check for the file signature because it loses its own signature whenever you inject something to it, right? And sincerely, nobody's doing this. OK, so this is, this is the stuff to show you. OK, the next thing to discuss is a lack of network monitoring. So, all the software that we have and all the appliances, yeah, 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 I'm aware of that. But the question is, you don't need to answer. Would it be possible in your organization if, when you were sitting over here having fun, your user was sending out the data through ICMP protocol somewhere to Google, for example? Hmm? Do you monitor your outgoing traffic with ICMP? Can a user ping Google? I bet he can. So. There is really a very limited amount of organizations that are filtering out ICMP protocol, which is like super easy. There are a lot of other ways to find out a way to communicate in between servers, not just ICMP, but ICMP, we are huge fans of it. So I'm going to show you that it's actually not the best thing to um, allow ICMP for outgoing traffic. OK. so. Let me sh first run Wireshark. This is the tool that you can download from the internet. And Laura Chappell is promoting Wireshark very much, with a reason, of course, because it's a great tool. And I'm going to use my software that you also have uh, with the package 
to, to be downloaded from my website, um, that is sending out data through ICMP. If you ever would like to have a revenge on your company or somebody pays you a lot of money for this super secret receipt, you might send it through ICMP and nobody will notice. Okay, so, MemoPad, and when you run it just like this, it's a simple notepad uh, that you can, you know, if you wanna buy some buns, bread, butter, whatever, then you can type it here just not to forget. But if you run MemoPad through the console, it's getting kind of evil. And I'm gonna run MemoPad, uh, and I'm going to send a file to, and in this case, it's gonna be our client machine, uh, because I don't have an access to the internet here, just in case it's done, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to start the monitoring, ICM, ICMP. The question is, what is inside ping? Can you tell me? Whenever you ping something, there's some message that you send to the server. What is it? Alphabet. Alphabet, right? You send A, B, C, D, and so on. Now I pretend that I know the alphabet. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is that we can actually send out the data through ICMP. And these are just two packets that just pop up. And I'm sending the data, and this is the, the context of the file. Blah, 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 hello world, secret message, invoices, your documents, your classified documents being sent out through ICMP. It's a different layer, it's a first layer. That's the protocol that nobody's monitoring. Okay. So let me go to let me go deeper. I will close that. We don't need that. Yeah, quit. Okay. File to DNS. That's the other tool. It's a my tool. You won't find it in the internet. You can download this from the web page. File to DNS. It's sending out the data in and that's better. DNS query which is a legal query according to RFC, so that your firewall or whatever you're using won't recognize this. I've tested it out, I'm doing this on client premises and nobody discovers that. So if you would like to send out data in DNS queries, and that's something that usually do not, you do not block out, that's, that's possible. So ABC, and what I've done, and this is the query that you're gonna see. You can monitor this, of course, in Network Miner, wherever, it's a real DNS traffic. What I've done, uh, I've decided to replace, as you see on the screen, the capital letters with the ASCII replacements so that, you know, admin won't recognize that something is happening to make it more geekier. Special characters and so on are also replaced with the ASCII signs so that they could went through the firewalls. So that's something that is actually, as you see, possible to be, to be done. Okay, that's something that could ha happen in your infrastructure? Hmm, <laughs> there is a chance, right? Okay, so the next thing to go to is, let me switch, what you see, it's not what you get. So administrators, whenever they see things, I'm not saying they trust the things that they see, but usually when you're doing things with the console, PowerShell, tools, and so on, you usually trust the result. But what's my point here? My point is that anything in the operating system can be injected. On my previous session, we were, doing the, uh, we were playing with the kernel mode, so you could see how much I am in control. This is how root kits are working. And if it's about the explorer.exe case, because I said that we are the owners of the process, we are also able to play with the process. We are able to kill the process. We are able to inject things in the process. So if somebody would like to inject something in explorer.exe, showing us the completely different stuff that we f have for real, it is possible. For example, like Linux desktop or whatever on the Windows machine. Okay, so let me show you, let me show you the story. So I'm going to go to my client machine here, and I'm going to run Explorer demo. 
which is in this case, very simple demo, I do have here two DLLs. One DLL is the one that you can actually, you have to actually pay for. This is this logic and the easy namespace extension zone. So this is a DLL that provides me uh, the, uh, the possibility to call for explore.exe extensions. While file system browser, this is my DLL that is working as a filter because I can inject it, meaning I can do whatever I want. Let me run it and I will show you how it works. So first of all, I will run it for the first time. Yeah. And then I will run it like it is. And as you see, I do have here this fake computer. So just to repeat it, no fake computer, fake computer. I call it fake because for you to see it's fake, but I may call it computer. And if the user has something like this on the desktop, the user may want to enter the fake computer and check out, oh, these are my files and so on. While for real, files are totally different because it's just a picture, it's explorer.exe extension that is showing you a little bit different stuff over here. So let me actually enlarge it for you to see what's the difference. So we're gonna go like this and over here, you see there is this good file.exe. But for real, I do have a little bit more files here, including the bad file and the ugly file. So if I rename this good.exe, so I I'm going to delete this bad here, and if I rename this good.exe to bad.exe, and I refresh the view over here, the file is gone. So that's the first thing, and that's like a piece of cake because it's an explorer.exe, but what if we, for example, are having a rootkit that is hiding stuff from us? It's the only place in which you can find it, it's a memory. Because rootkits are using and are injecting into the operating system functions too, and may totally influence the whole, uh, the whole things that are displayed to you uh, as an admin over here. Okay, so summarizing the things that we said, is that what you see, of course, it's not what you get. Uh, whenever you were doing the troubleshooting, whenever you try to figure out what was happening and so on, yes, you may succeed, but you never know if there is something in the back working, waiting for your reaction and so on. So whenever you feel something is wrong with your workstation, sincerely, the best thing is just to reinstall it. Because nowadays, stuff is really advanced, people are really smart with figuring out where to hide their data, including rootkits, as I mentioned, so that usually we may not totally delete the stuff that are working on our computers. Okay, so this was the sin number three. The sin number two, it's too much trust in people. <sighs> I mean, they're from Poland. They must be from Poland. <laughs> so too much trust in people in two ways. The first way is we trust our admins, being a manager, being the other admin, and we trust our users. So sometimes we just give for a second the administrative access because somebody needs it, but it's a second for a second too much because this person may use uh, these privileges in a little bit different way. So. I would say it's more organizational problem rather than something else, because whenever we too put too much trust in people, it means that we really don't care about the security because they may do whatever their imagination tells you. Like if somebody pays you, as I said before, for grabbing the data from your company, why not? Do you trust these people? Maybe it's just a nice lady. So I would like to show you a couple of situations in which we put too much trust in people, in both users and administrators. So first mistake that I have over here, and let me run Fiddler again, and let me ask you the question. It's a beta version, so no. Uh, nothing, of course, against Microsoft's betas. Sorry for that. Um, and I'm going to run one website. Do you like horses? Do you ride a horse? Okay, you're sitting at the computers, right? Okay, 
So this, this is the company uh, that is selling socks for horses. If you like buy the horse and you like socks, then that's the website to go. They're cheating a little bit because they do have this purple cute socks on the picture, while actually they do not exist. But whatever, it's just the marketing. OK, so what do we have here? We do have socks, the, the gray socks, white socks, vast vari a huge variety of choices. I'm going to buy one. One. And I'm going to add it to a cart. So as you see, it's 44, blah, 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 $99. Too expensive. So what I will do in Fiddler, I will go to Rules, Automatic Breakpoints, Before Requests. And then I will monitor all the stuff that is happening with this web page. So before I add it to a cart, you see the Fiddler is blinking, and it's actually pointing me to accept the stuff that we have. But I'm really not accepting the price. And I don't want to pay for a socks $34, come on. I'm going to pay two. They're not even nice. Run to completion. Poor horses. What's that about? I mean, who is posting the web page without the procedure to test it out? This can cause a huge financial problems. And seriously, I'm showing you just the stupid socks. And do you like the Cisco stuff? Expensive one? Hmm? Yeah, check, check for that. You're going to find a lot of places <laughs> to buy yourself something for Eastern. <laughs> OK, the second thing is that, and that's going to be a super short demo, is your credit card stolen? You know the web page? <laughs> How can it be? The second one, because I was pretty inspired by the solution, and is your email listed in the spammers database? OK. Paula at secure, uh, let me check it out. <laughs> yeah, now it is. <laughs> so these are users. And um, the other things are check your edge. People are publishing enormous things, like crazy ones. For example, there is this database that is called Shodan, and the website is shodanhq.com. Make, make sure that you've got an account over there. Because uh, now Google hacking is a little bit outdated. People are, don't have time and so on. So you would like to have you know, your research in place, which this is what Shodan is doing. If you would like to find out what people are doing, like in a hotel in Miami, <clears throat> you can check it out. <laughs> I mean, there are many uh, places to go in Shodan. So let me actually display the Shodan first. And you can, for example, search directory for uh, the, the really popular things and check out what is, for example, in Amsterdam. Forgive me, I was searching for Amsterdam and I found a really cute stuff, but we are here, so some people may be offended. Uh, but they are monitoring their houses. Once I saw in Thailand when people were replacing money in ATM. And this was actually a pretty typical scenario. You know, one person is working, five other are standing and smoking cigarettes, right? But uh, this is what you can see. And they were putting their codes and so on. And there was a kind of camera watching, and I was watching, of course. So a so couple of stuff it's published to the internet, not intentionally. OK. So um, let me go and show you the other thing regarding the administrative uh, trust. So domain controller that we have over there. And there is a, a thing. And let me copy the first the, the PowerShell command. I'm going to copy this one. And I'm going to put it in the PowerShell. Um, yeah. So um, edit, paste. Oh, it's not working like this. Uh, sorry. So let me quickly rewrite it. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing over here, so I will explain at the same time, is that I'm actually listing the amount of users uh, in the domain um, and 
this is the domain name. Uh, and I'm going to type this out and stick that, yeah. And then I'm going to measure object to show you what is the number of objects, the user objects in Active Directory. Super simple, right? So the thing is that in Windows 2003, without a service pack, there was an undiscovered vulnerability uh, that uh, was actually allowing you to convert the static users to dynamic. Hmm, what does it mean? It means that the users that you are using are static, obviously, you, you just have them, you may log in and blah, 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 use them for different purposes, but dynamic users, they do have their own entry TTL value, which is a time to live. I mean, user is dead, right? So the situation that is happening is that you will create a bunch of users that's going to disappear with time. And the question is, if you are like an Active Directory person, you may be like, okay, but we may recover them. No, because dynamic objects are not constant. Hmm. So this is actually a really huge nightmare for organization if somebody creates, like from now, the accounts that are dynamic. And you can use them as a normal accounts and so on. And after the administrator is gone because he's changing his job to the other job and he doesn't like the previous company, the time is flying and after the specific number of seconds, all accounts will be gone. You are in trouble. So let me show you how to produce this trouble. <laughs> I do have simple demo here. First of all, I do have create LDF file over here. And what I'm doing, I am creating the file that I'm going to use later on as a parameter with the specific attributes. But pay attention to this dynamic object. So the user is going to be a dynamic object. And uh, it has its own entry TGL value percent one, which is going to be the number of seconds that the user is going to be alive, meaning user 20 is going to be alive for 20 seconds. Now, it's not possible to convert from static to dynamic because it was patched. But it's possible to create dynamic user. <laughs> so, you know how it works. The second thing is I do have here this do it script. And it's super easy because I would like to automate a couple of things. Uh, and I'm, I'm creating the user accounts using the file I've just created with, with, the, with the script. Using LDI FDE, so you know the tool to play with Active Directory objects. Awesome. So let me close this one and let me actually run do it. Yep, and here we go. We do have many user accounts that are created successfully when we manage this and check out how many, you see 99, so we've created them. Let me first go to Etsy Edit to play a little bit with the uh, attributes that we have here. So I'm going to go to Default Naming Context Users, and then I will pick the user that should be dead already, which is the user 15. This user is alive for 15 seconds. Properties, and then Attribute Editor tab, I'm going to Entry TTL, and as you see, the value is zero. This user is dead. So another user is going to be, let's say, user 200, which means it's alive for 200 seconds. We'll have this pro attribute still doing a countdown, but it's now 153. Hmm, do you feel a pressure? A little bit. And for TTL, it's 140 right now. So time is running. It's the same user, user 200. Hmm, awesome. But if I go to a PowerShell one more time, and I do this command one more time, you see that it's 99. This is because in the Active Directory, there is a service running that whenever, every time we do have uh, some trash, it's cleaning out with the specific frequency. So because it's, we, do ha we don't have time, and it's a very short session, uh, we, j we just may want to enforce it a little bit. And brush it. Okay, so I'm going, go, I'm, I'm going to go to my tools folder and then I will run lvp.exe 
This is a free tool that you can get from the Microsoft web page, the resource kit, and so on. And I'm going to bind to the domain. So password. I'm, I'm there, and I'm going to click Browse, Modify, and I'm going to enforce the service to run, which is do garbage collection with the value one, operation at, enter, brush out. And it's brushed out. So let me show you actually how it works. And here you have 75 users. That's serious. So if you would like to have the revenge, then you see what, what is happening over there. That's why I mean, whenever we do have this too much trust in people, it's definitely worth controlling the second admin. And there is a tool uh, that I really like. It's called Autoruns. I'm not saying even about this, about the general system configuration. And every week, do the snapshot. Check out what is inside. What kind of drivers do you have? What kind of processes do you have? What kind of services do you have? What is new in the registry? Blah, 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 blah. So every situation, every place within operating system that you may put something that is, of course, malicious, should be reported. And then, at the end of the next week, you will just compare the results. And it's like, hmm, there is something new. What is this? Of course, it may be a little bit uh, too much. But it's just a couple of quick clicks. And every week, it's definitely not enough. OK, so let me show you 75 again. I'm going to brush it out again. And it's 60. And our infrastructure is down. OK, so the next thing that I'm going to show you is the control of the operating system from the outside from the internet, for example, from your blog, for example. So I do have here the second server. And normally, I do have it online, and it's a real server. But just in case the internet is gone, I have it uh, offline. Uh, hmm. So I have here the website saying, still no updates. And this word, still, it's very delicate. Because if I remove it, things are going to execute. So it's, it's working a little bit in the reverse way. I'm checking. Is the word still there? Is the word still there? Is the word still there? When it's not there, execute. So it's like a time bomb or the blog bomb. So over here, let me go to the Windows. For, oh, so that's uh, stupid me. It's like, whatever. Let me run the console. We don't need it anymore. OK, uh, whenever we would like to. Um, Check out if we do have some TXT files in the Windows folder. So this is my Paolo's malware war here, was here. So this one you all know already. And if I check for it, it's all the same. But being on this side, if I change, so let me go to the root folder over there. And um, let me go to uh, init.pub www root because it's IIS update.txt. Let me remove this word and save the file. So this is the blog administrator is sitting somewhere else. Then on the domain controller, you see something pop. So th I've got the service that is checking out if something is there. If it's not there, then if internet is gone, then and so on. So monitoring the services, it's really important because service is one of the places that evil people would like to go. Okay. So with this positive accent, we are getting to the first scene. Do you agree? <laughs> exactly. So all the problems, and you may say like, oh, but I think offline access should be the first one. Yeah, but if something happens, it would be really nice, not just with infrastructure, maybe with people. It would be really nice to have the way how to recover, to know how to recover, you know, all these companies that are putting the people in a plane and they are sending out the whole team in the same, with the same transport. It's, it's life, right? So whenever we are expecting some problems, it's really nice to have the way uh, to recover, which is the doc documentation. Whenever we are outsourcing something, it's not too ha nice to have the nice SLA. And I know that I'm very obvious right now. But I think that documentation is the biggest problem here. And I think also that it's not the problem of administrators. 
it's more a problem of the management that is not supporting the security, that is not supporting the infrastructure. They just know that there are some IT people sitting in the pavement and they're like, you know, doing their own job just to give them pizza under the door and provide a tap with Coca-Cola and they're gonna be functioning really well. well I'm, you know what I mean. So, so lack of documentation, I think it's the biggest problem nowadays if it's about the sins. Okay, so bringing the session to the end. We've discussed 10 deadly sins. You might have your own one, but my goal of this session, my goal of this session, sincerely, is that if you take at least one of the sins and take it home or take it to work and prepare yourself from the situations that I've showed you, I believe that we're gonna be a little bit more secure. I would suggest that we could start from the services because this is really common, really easy to exploit and it provides you a little bit too much access to the stuff that users should not have access to. So if you could take at least one, it would be super fantastic. Do the periodical checks, make sure you know what is running on the server, not just applications, but also the processes, DLLs that you have. If you could compare the list of the DLLs, it would be super nice, because DLLs, as we discussed on my previous sessions, does not need to be signed to be running in the memory which provides a fantastic field for many unwanted situations. So, thank you so much. Uh, these are the track resources, including my favorite website. <laughs> yes. So, uh, if you could fill the evaluation at the end of the session, I will really appreciate it. Couple of resources, you know, Microsoft is everywhere. If you had any questions, I will be in the at least in the stairs whenever you enter the exhibition call, because lately it, last time it was closed, so I will be up the stairs. If you had any questions, please come. And link for the tools, right? If you haven't saved it at the end, it's, and make sure you write the small letters. It's running on, you know. stderr.pl, and it's secure, and then it's tools.zip. The memo pad to send out data through ICMP, the file to DNS, and so on. All the stuff are there. So uh, definitely use it. Try not to share it, but definitely enjoy it. So thank you very much. One more time.